Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back into our Father's Word here in a moment. Book of Ecclesiastes, Keholith in the Hebrew tongue. It means the convener or preacher, drawing people together and giving them the Word of God. Actually, this is such a fascinating book for one reason. It's written to the man that walks under the sun. That means it's written to you in a flesh body. Not your spiritual body, but your flesh body. Telling you how to find completeness, happiness, and to be happy in these flesh bodies, and naturally knowing that you have another body, which is a spiritual body, and that you bring Almighty God in the equation of your life. You're going you're gonna to have it pretty good. There's... Um, a lot of things can happen. We're going to probably, with today and tomorrow, finish this book and uh, how fascinating it is You're telling you how to find happiness even in a flesh body. Chapter 11, verse 1, Word of Wisdom from Our Father. Let's read it. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. This is really translated in many ways by, <coughs> excuse me, different people. It would seem that certain of the secular uh, trends like to translate it that when the rivers overflowed their banks in the spring and basically the silt would fertilize the ground and when the stream would go back down, then you plant your seed there uh, the, the wheat, the bread, and it, it'll grow twice as much. I, I don't buy that. I, I still must go with the prophetic sense. As it is written in Revelation chapter 17, the waters symbolize people. And naturally, bread is the bread of life. That's Christ's body. And when, when you take the truth of our Lord and Savior, and you cast that out, broadcast it out on people, or share, um, share it with uh, planting seeds with even one individual, it's going to come back to you sooner or later when people realize the truth and want the blessings of Almighty God. So it, it, you're never, never wasting your time in planting seeds that will bring hope and completeness to the life of a lost soul. Verse 2, give a portion to seven, also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Uh, in other words, when, when you've got it real good, be generous. Uh, seven is spiritual complete, completeness and eight is new beginnings. What it's saying is, is you share with what you have, uh, and, and it could even be the bread of life if you're blessed with an abundance of it. But what it's saying is, is you never know what evil may befall, and you're going to be poor. You're going to be needing a handout. It can happen to everybody. There are times you're up, and there are times you're down. And for one that is well-founded in the bread of life, one that is well-founded in the Word of God, you're going to do fine whether you're up or whether you're down. Why? Because God is in the equation of your life, and you know that regardless of what happens in hard times here on earth, you have the eternity made. You have eternal life awaiting you but also, you know, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that you're never going to be tested over what you can handle. 
and that God will never give you more than you can handle, and he will always show you a way through. Why? He loves you. So really, uh, regardless of what kind of hard times fall or what is there, but do know when, when you're up, that's fine. Be, be generous. But when you're down, it could even happen to you. God will always take care of his own. Verse 3, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth, and if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. That's pretty final. But, but know this, that's nature at work. Okay. The, the water will fall from those clouds that will wet the soil. Down the river it goes, into the ocean. Humidity takes place, and the, the dew point rises, and the clouds form, and the water comes right back over the river and the earth, and down it comes again. That's God's re, re, uh, reproducing to bring life, uh, not only to people, but to everything he's created. It takes water. And he knows when we need it. But at the same time, when the wind blows, and wind is symbolic of spirit and trees are symbolic of people, whichever way they fall to the north or the south, if, if you're in the forest, that's it. That's the way it is. So you learn to face reality and take responsibility for your life, for there is nothing. This goes all the way back to the first chapter in this great book. There's nothing new under the sun. That that has been um, uh, is happening again. And what's happening now has always been before. So that's the way God teaches us. It's a repeat of life over and over and over. So pretty soon you'll catch on and you'll enjoy life. Verse 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. In other words, if you're a worry ward, oh, it's just, I, I, I'd like to plant my crop, but it, it's just too risky, it's, it's going to drown out, and this is going to happen to it, and that's going to happen to it. You always allow the eternal principle and law to intervene, or you're not going to get anything done. You'll never get anything done, and you'll be a failure if you wait until everything is exactly right. Now, what about, um, what about eternal uh, um, uh, principles? Well, when you learn horticulture, you know what, what is necessary to cause a plant to do well, but also you know God's laws. There's the law of gravity, and there's the law of the wind as well. Though you never know for sure, but pretty soon you uh, educate yourself in meteorology to a point whereby you can pick a place and you dare go in and you get it done. And it may not be perfect, and you know something? There's nothing unusual about having to replant a crop. It gets washed out. But that's fine. Replant. And uh, certainly, that way you're going to have something. Otherwise, if you sit back, a worry wart, you want everything to be just right, you're never going to have anything. Because uh, you, you are not trying. First of all, you're not trusting God to give you the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to play with and your game in his own nature. For it's pretty easy to read if you watch it closely, if you educate yourself, if you go by eternal principles and God's law, law of gravity, law of jet streams, law of everything. And God will take care of you and, and lead you on. But hey, 
If you have the seed in your barn, it's not going to grow. The seed must be in the ground. Verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. But, you know, this is where trust in our Heavenly Father comes in. Father doesn't wake up every morning wanting to destroy somebody. Father loves his children. And it, it is true that you don't know that how that little one is doing in that womb, but God does. And, and so it is. He, he created life itself. It's a awesome, awesome thing. It's, uh, any way you want to slice it, it's a miracle, really, that uh, these things happen, that the bones form, that, and there comes uh, forth a, a living, breathing child. And, and certainly, our, our Father knows how that is. You, but you, never, you don't know what is the way of the Spirit. That can be the you, that can be translated the wind. You never know which way the wind's going to blow. Wind in the Hebrew, spirit in the Hebrew is rock, which means the wind. And certainly, uh, the the important thing is that you don't miss the last line of that verse. Even so, thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. He, he does. He makes it. He doesn't make failures necessarily. Failures are brought on by mismanagement of man, and, and uh, so it is. Uh, otherwise, if you know eternal principles and God's law, you're, you're going to get by most of the time quite well. Verse 6, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thy hand, for thou knowest not whither shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. And in other words, um, I, I could explain that verse by saying, go for it. You, you plant your seed in the morning and go ahead and find something else to do the rest of the day. You, the seed, whether it'll grow or whatever you accomplish later, maybe it was repairing the barn or whatever the case may be, you're, it's, it's, it's going to turn out good. Some of it may turn out bad. So what? But you went for it. You plowed deep. You were responsible. And you took responsibility. I suppose there's one thing you want to always remember, and I don't say this to make people feel bad or anything else. God doesn't like lazy people. Okay. And uh, this has nothing to do with handicapped people or people that are ill, okay? But able-bodied, ready-to-go, can-do type people, he expects the best from you. If you want to take responsibility, if you want to succeed, you've got to amount to something. You've got to be somebody that someone can call on and you can give good advice or, or help or whatever the case may be. But... Don't, don't be a, a part-time this or a part-time that unless you put two part-times together to make it a full-time. You go for it. Go for life. Enjoy life. Work at it. You'll do just fine. Why? Because God will assist when you take responsibility. Verse 7. Truly, the light is sweet. And a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. You know, the sun is necessary. It's, it's what makes, you know, if you don't believe the sun is necessary, take a seed sometime and plant it and leave it in the dark. Put it where the sun can't reach it. I, I don't advise this because it's going nowhere. The sun gives life. And when you a break a little plant into receiving light, then that sun causes it to grow. It gives the growth. 
And it even is good for man that you have that light. And of course, spiritually speaking, it is the light that gives us direction, and Christ is that light. But the sun itself, when you're speaking concerning crops, which basically we are, casting your bread upon the waters, planting, don't quit, keep it going, then the sun, when you learn God's law concerning the solar, you have your calendar, the solar calendar is accurate, right to the day. Moons, they change all the time. Solar, right on, because why? We're children of light. We need the sun. We have to have that sun to be healthy and to be happy and to even compete with nature itself. You need that sun, you need that light and how precious it is. It's what makes things grow. Even children, as far as that's concerned, though it must be handled in a way that you don't overdo. Too much sun will bring sunburn. So you, you have to use common sense and take responsibility for life. Verse 8 to continue. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they, they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. In other words, be prepared for both. As I said earlier in this lecture, there's ups and there's downs. And enjoy, really enjoy the good days in life tremendously. I mean, really take them in. Because there's, there's, you prepare yourself mentally to know there's going to be some bad. Well, what do I do? Fall all to pieces? No. You plow and you plow deep. You get it done. You never let a little hardship take you down. When, when it's a little too tough for everybody else, that's the way we like it. Because we have God with us. And he always sees us through. Naturally, it is better to have pleasant times. But God didn't promise us a rose garden of life forever. He did not have one himself. They crucified him. They tortured him. And he didn't complain because he was doing it for you. So be prepared to know. Enjoy the good times. Enjoy the blessings of God. But at the same time, know there will be problems come along, but you can cut it. You can handle it. Why? Because you have God with you. It is the work of God. It is his way in handling life, and certainly uh, you, I suppose the, the clue here would be be prepared. You set yourself mentally where you're prepared for whatever comes along. Don't, don't panic. You know, when people panic, they lose it. It's, it's like if you're driving a car and things are looking like you're about to have an accident, that's not a time to panic. That's a time to do your very best and avoid it. Never give up. I mean, take it right to the last nth of time. You find it and keep control. And then after it's all over with, if you want to shake a little bit, that's all right. The danger is gone. But as long as you are under pressure, you be your very best. You be prepared to handle whatever comes along. Because God is with you. It makes a lot of difference, my friend. And certainly, um, God will pull you through many hardships. If, if you do your part, be prepared mentally to handle any situation that comes along calmly and using common sense and taking responsibility 
And then after it's over, if you want to be a little nervous, that's fine. But not while it's happening. You must perform excellent. It must be right on the line. And you can't do that if you're frightened or all shook up. Uh, be prepared for any situation at any time. But enjoy the good times. That's what he's saying here. Verse 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and, and um, in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. In other words, while you're young, you enjoy your youth. You enjoy being able to do things and live life to the fullest uh, while you're young and healthy. But, but do know, whatever you do, God's going to judge you. So always shape your life and form it to where it's pleasing to God. And you don't have to worry about judgment. Judgment for you then becomes a payday. It becomes a day of blessing. Because why? You've earned it. And God is always fair. God always gives you everything you've got coming to you. That's what judgment is. Judgment for some, I can understand why they would dread it. But for others, it's beautiful. It's payday. It's when God gives us our blessings because why we've earned it. You're always going to get what you've got coming to you. But while you're young... And that's, uh, youth can be anywhere from 6 to 80. Enjoy life. Enjoy it to the fullest. And why? Because God created it that we should enjoy it. But uh, while you have your help and are able to do things, that's the time to really accomplish and set aside your storehouse. Be prepared for it. Look ahead. Plan. And, and make sure that you do it whereby you know on Judgment Day, God's going to bless you real good. Verse 10 to complete the chapter. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Don't waste it. You can waste it if you're not careful. Any experience is, is a, is, can cause trouble. But experience in life brings uh, quality to life because you know what is good and you go that route and God blesses it. Uh, it is so precious. So don't, don't let sorrow take over your heart. That's called grief. Don't grieve. Um, I don't care if it is a loved one that goes to be with the Father. Uh, naturally, you're going to mourn, but they're blessed. The one you love is with the Father, and everything is well. It, it is beautiful to enjoy life and to remove sorrow from your heart. And the way you do that is not to look at the vanity, the emptiness, but look at what God has prepared for us. He prepared this earth in the way it is with, the, with its um, eternal principles and its law. And that's the way this earth operates, is by his principles and by his law. That way when you learn those things, and how to deal with them, whether you're young or whether you're old. You're going to be blessed one way or the other. And there will be ups and there will be downs. There will be vanity, that's emptiness, uh, if you allow it. But, well, how do, how, how, do I, how do I go around vanity or emptiness or, or chasing the wind, like it has stated many times, in this book, the first part of this sentence, therefore remove sorrow from thy heart. You don't have time for it. 
God is too good to us. You know, he sent us this word. And this word even became flesh and walked around among us for a while, teaching and leading and directing and showing us how to take sorrow away from our heart and to rejoice and count our blessings, to enjoy the sun, that the sun that gives life, to know how to enjoy our crops that we plant, or if your profession happens to be industry, enjoy your output. Be proud of it. You've accomplished something, and God is proud. So all, all this, remember, as you enjoy these things and as you take responsibility for your life, then no judgment day is coming and always have it in your favor. A wise person with all wisdom coming from God, he's got his retirement in heaven well prepared. It's, the blessings are there and they're waiting. And you look forward to the judgment day when as somebody that is evil, they must dread it because like you, they're gonna get everything they've got coming to you. So there you have it, uh, chapter 11. Let's go a verse or two here in chapter 12. And chapter 12, verse 1 reads, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Um, and certainly having God in the equation of your life it makes it real easy to enjoy life. So, uh, but what, what it's saying here, there comes a time you're going to get old. So enjoy your youth as you have it and accomplish something. Prepare things. Have, have it laid by whereby when, when, you, um, when you are older and um, the years draw nigh, the years for what? Well, they, they're uh, of passing. Then um, certainly um, know that God will always, we, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And in that, we have that eternal life. Uh, again, having Yahweh's help always gives us a way, the very path. Verse 2, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Um, in other words, um, when, when you get old, sometimes it's difficult to see the brightness of the light or even the moon, things dim somewhat, meaning eyesight kind of can really drift away, and, and you can have problems with that. M more difficult to enjoy yourself uh, when those days come for, for some. Verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, that, that's your arms, the house is the body, and the arms keep it. If They grow a little weak and they tremble. And the strong men shall bow themselves. Your legs are not as strong as they used to be. And the grinders cease. The old teeth just kind of give up. Okay, They don't grind too good anymore. They cease because they are few. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. The windows are your eyes and the, and looking out is the eyelid. It's darkened, and you don't, your vision is not what it was at, at youth, and, and that's fine. You'll, you'll do just absolutely all right. You always make, it, uh, make allowances, and always keep it as healthy possibly as you can, because it is true that old age shall come. The teeth will wear, the arms will grow weak, the legs will grow weak as, uh, as age comes along, but then that's normal. 
best part of life, basically. Um, the thing is, always exercise and keep yourself as healthy as possible and you can prevent much whereby you have good quality of life for a long, long time. And, and the main thing is, is enjoy life. Let's say that the, the uh, grinders get a little low. Well, let, fix it. In this modern day and time, you can be fixed and you can enjoy. So never give up and always look up. The Redeemer draweth nigh. And we certainly have far better things ahead than we have now. Even when the windows are darkened and the eyes closed, we have ways of being able to see better. And, and so it is. Uh, verse 4. And the doors shall be shut in the streets uh, when the sound of the grinding is low. The door to the body is your mouth, okay? And uh, when, when it is shut and the sound of grinding is low, that means your ears, your hearing kind of drifts away. And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. That's called insomnia. He'd, when you get a little low, you don't sleep as well. And you wake up maybe even before the birds do. And all the daughters of music shall be brought low. I mean, you can't hear the old music like you used to. They always turn it down where you can hardly hear it. And the people don't sing as loud as they used to, okay? Because your hearing kind of drifts away. But that's no biggie. We, we know by God's um, very eternal per principles and his law, this is going to happen. It happens to everyone. Therefore, learn how to handle it. Learn how to live with it. We'll pick this up in the next lecture and complete this book. Don't miss it. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge, we leave all that judging in his department. And we simply spiritually discern right from wrong and stick to the right. And you will do quite well. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the, at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request, you don't need the phone number. You don't need an address. God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. He created you different than anyone else. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. He wanted somebody just like you. So, but he does want you to love him if you want his blessings. That's, that opens the gate of blessings from him. And, and, but you have to tell him. Tell him you love him. If you mean it, now don't try, ever try to con him, that's, that's not good.
but how can you help but love him when he gives you oxygen, when he gives you the sun, when he gives you life? Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Robert from Louisiana. How did the giants get back on earth if they were killed in the flood? Um, I'm, I'm going to recommend that you read Appendix 25 in the Companion Bible. Your answer there, of course, is that there was a second influx, a second influx of them. And when you read that 25th appendix, it will, it will explain and, and even give you scripture concerning that. You'll enjoy it. Uh, Patricia from Florida. When we go to heaven with our new body, is there a difference as to whether we are cremated or buried? No. Th this cremation or burial happens to the flesh body. There is no way somebody can cremate or bury the spiritual body. Why? Because it goes back to the Father from whence it came instantly. When, when the flesh dies, you're out of here. Uh, and you know something? This spiritual body you leave in is the same body you came in. So which is your real body? You might think about that. But as you will learn in the next lecture, when we get to verses 6 and 7, that um, these flesh bodies go back to dust, whether it's cremation or burial. But your spiritual body goes back to the Father from whence it came. It, it comes, goes back where it came, from where it came, because that's where you came from. You were with the Father. And um, uh, certainly the recognition of that will become very forward at that time and how precious it is. It does not matter. I know that many times incomes at this time, it's very expensive, whereas cremation is not that expensive. So uh, your choice doesn't matter to our Father. A uh, car from uh, uh, North Carolina. Pastor, please explain what communion is and why we take it. I am a new Christian. Please give me scripture so I can learn Father's Word. Matthew 26, 26 is probably a good place to start. Where Christ, uh, he took the cup, the wine that is fermented, and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. And um, then before that, he would take the bread and break it and say, this is my body that is broken for you. So that's what communion is. It's symbolic of you partaking of the Lord's table and the very blood that cleanses you, that paid the price, one in all times, is there, and that's what it symbolizes and that's why it's so precious. Uh, Miles from Minnesota. It's my understanding that Passover is 15 days after the spring equinox, which should be April the 5th through the 8th, uh, somewhere. My 2013 wall calendar says Passover starts March the 25th at sunset. What gives? Well, because some people go by moon. Um, is it because they're people of the night? Well, I guess so. Because all prophecies given in moons have to do with Satan. In other words, as you read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, that Satan won't have 1,260 days solar, but he has 42 months. That's moons, darkness. All prophecies concerning him are in moons. So uh, the solar calendar is exact. The spring equinox begins the new year, and you are correct. 
That's why we as children of light are always going to celebrate Passover by the solar calendar. Uh, this would be Jeannie from California. Would you, would you please explain to us the book of Numbers, chapter 11, the verses about God's, um, God's creation created on the people, God's wrath on the people because they wanted to eat flesh or meat and not manna from heaven. Um, is uh, God, if God was against eating meat and why? No, he, he wasn't. This is why he finally let a wind bring in quail, and quail is meat. And he fed them with that meat. It, it is not that they did not love the manna. The manna was angel's food, and it sustained them. But they were used. They were used to meat. Now, God gives you in Leviticus 11 the very meats you should eat and the meat you shouldn't eat. One is good, the other is bad. One will make you healthy, the other will make you sick. So, what is important is that you understand God's health laws and follow them. He created these bodies. He knows what makes them healthy. You will have so many people that will say, well, God cleansed everything because all animals are good. Sure, that's why he created them. But they each have a purpose. This is why in um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 3 and 4, it says there, don't let anyone judge you in marriage or don't let anyone judge you in what you eat in that that God created to be received. They leave that part of the sentence out. I'll say it again. Don't let man judge you from eating meat from that that God created to be received. He didn't create all animals to be received as meat. If you read on, it will say in blessings, all God's animals are good, and they are. A scavenger, which you're not supposed to eat, is good because it keeps disease consumed from off the earth to keep you from getting sick. That's God's way of doing things. There's no sin in eating meat. If, um, if you want to be a vegetarian, hey, it's your choice, no problem. Diana from Alabama. What happens if one of the elect here on earth gets killed or in an accident that takes their life and their spirit is no longer on earth to be for the Holy Spirit to speak through them against Satan? God gives free will, and this sounds like he would not interfere. I would, I, I, I have loved Jesus Christ since, since uh, first, I first heard about him. Well, they, they became, if you read Romans chapter 11, ever since the beginning of time, we have had the remnant that brought forth the truth. Do you understand that even Enoch himself that was good and God just took he was preaching the real word. You can read that in, in the book of Jude, oh, along about verse uh, 7 or somewhere along. In, no, it's more than that, about 10 or 12, somewhere. Uh, Enoch was a preacher, and he was preaching against those fallen angels intermixing with the daughters of Adam. So, and so it is that uh, that's a remnant the remnant brings forth the truth and then passes on. God's elect stand against the Antichrist at the end. Is there a difference? Not really. They're all God's children. John from Louisiana. In what chapter and verse can I find where it gives a description of America? I, well, first off, we know that God scattered the ten northern tribes. That he scattered them to the point that most of them don't even know who they are. 
they are called in God's word the house of Israel, not the house of Judah. The house of Israel and the house of Judah are separate houses at this time especially. They will be joined back together, but not at this time. But so they, they went over the Caucasus Mountains, settled Europe, many of them later coming to this nation, and uh, certainly um, uh, settling it. I think if you read, and God never misses anything in prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 18, you hear of this nation that is divided by rivers like the Mississippi, the Arkansas, the Colorado, and so forth. It's divided. And, and um, it sends ambassadors all over the world. This, this description in the end times, which is what it has reference to, doesn't fit too many nations. It fits the superpower of superpowers. There's only one, really. It's, unfortunately, it's kind of weakening, but still there. It's this nation. God didn't just uh, have it happen by accident. Gene from Wisconsin, if you have your pantry stocked, will you be able to use that food if it was brought prior to the tribulation of Antichrist? Um, absolutely, yes. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend that even today because of weather, truck strikes, or, or bad crops, drought, or whatever, that you have a certain amount of food on hand. <clears throat> Canned material will keep for a considerable length of time and use it and replenish it. But um, al always be prepared. You prepare for the bad times. And, and that's the way you prepare. You, you look ahead, you look down the road, and when that trouble comes, you're ready for it. Uh, Marion from Washington. God says people who abandon their children are worse than an infidel. What does an infidel mean to God? It's, it's an, an infidel is an unbelieving heathen. Um, I don't know exactly what does that mean? unbelieving in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're an unbelieving heathen. That's the way God looks at them. That's not an insult. You're quoting here from Timothy, and what it says is a, a father that will not take care of his own children is worse than an infidel. And that's true if um, God expects a father to be responsible. Uh, Nick from Pennsylvania. Does our spiritual body have bones? Does it have weight and mass? Thank you. Document, please, in Scripture. Well, have you ever read uh, in Genesis, what, how was man created? What did God say? Let us create man in our image. Image, you could even say phantom, I mean, exactly alike. Only one is spiritual and one is flesh. But they are exactly alike. If they are exactly alike, then naturally they have to have bones. That is the structure. Why did they have these vehicles in Ezekiel? Because they had mass and they had to be delivered. It was their transportation. So uh, naturally your answer lies in God's creation. Angel's food, manna, sustains a flesh body. Why? Because it's made in the perfect image of what it was. And what would keep it before would keep it then. And, and so it is. That's your documentation. E from Georgia. Where, in the, where is the Ark of the Covenant? What scriptures would document this? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, one day with the Lord is a thousand years. Please explain and give scripture for a second witness. Revelation chapter 20. The millennium is how long? A millennium means a thousand years. What day is that? Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. 
It is the Lord's day. <clears throat> the millennium is the Lord's day. It's his time of teaching. The Ark of the Covenant is already in heaven. You can read it in the last two verses of the great 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. It is already there. And um, did God take it back? Yes, he did. <clears throat> Why? Because man wasn't taking care of it. James from Indiana. Why did Jesus choose to be Jewish in this earth age? He didn't, and he wasn't. His father, um, Mary's father, was of the tribe of Judah. But Mary's mother was of the tribe of Levi. So Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, the king line, but he was also of the tribe of Levi, the priest line. Therefore, adequately called forever after the order of Melchizedek, king of kings and lord of lords, both houses. Uh, you will find Mary's genealogy in chapter 3 of Luke. It's not, it's not Matthew chapter 1. Okay, this would be um, uh, Mr. Butts. I have been watching your program, thank you. I have a question. I would like to ask or get an answer. Why did God make Satan when he knew, <coughs> excuse me, what he was going to do? I just wonder about this and sometimes. Well, well, first off, God didn't know what he would do. He gave him, he created him almost perfect, as it's written in Ezekiel 28. But he did give him free will. He wanted him to have free will because he wanted him to love him. You cannot know what somebody's going to do if you give them total free will. But you see, there's only one way you can have true love also. And that is if you give somebody free will. They are free to love you, or hate you, or, or whatever, not care. <clears throat> so, therefore, God created us all in that respect, except the elect. And even in the first earth age, they were likewise, but they earned the right to stand against Satan in the end times because they stood against him there. But, but Satan, Satan uh, as you read, he is called the king of Tyrus in the Hebrew tongue. Tyrus means in the Hebrew tongue rock. But he's not our rock, he's their rock. And, and certainly he earned the right to be one of the cherubs that protects the mercy seat. But he was pretty good. He went a long way in elevating himself because God didn't just give it to him. He earned it. And then he took pride within himself. And pride brought about his fall. He loved himself more than he loved God. And the sad part was he drew a third of God's children away from God. And that's when he put a stop to it. Our father did. Uh, B.J. from Arkansas, I do have a question. What does Matthew 5.22 mean? I understand it all except where it says, Whosoever shall say thou fool will be in danger of hell fire. Does this mean if you call a person a fool? No, no you, have to go, you have to use the Greek here. The Greek is rock. And it means you're calling a person moros. Our word moron comes from that. You're, you're calling them a name other than, not just fool or foolish or silly, but it's rock. And it means absolutely, hopelessly, away from God without a prayer of a chance. God doesn't want you to tell somebody they do not have a prayer of a chance, that they are no good, worthless, and can never, never be forgiven. That's what you're calling them when you call them raka. 
Why? Because we plant seeds and they grow. God, you, you don't know when that person is is uh, raka or whether they are, are deceived. But they can always change. God, through the Son, paid an awesome price on the cross to bring salvation to whomsoever will. So don't you go around telling somebody they do not fit that category, they're doomed because they're worthless. Um, that would be a sin. Jack from Arizona. What scriptures in the Bible talk about gay marriage? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, and Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 talks about same-sex marriage. Uh, you have to read it for yourself. I'll repeat it. Leviticus 20, 13 lets you know about same-sex marriage. Uh, Charles from North Carolina. Is the United States or North America mentioned in the Bible? Well, we covered that before. Um, I, I believe it's Isaiah 18, and I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it, it makes his day. When you read the letter that he has sent to you with understanding and, and requesting his blessing, it makes his day, and when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, the 30th chapter of the great book of Jeremiah, he whom God launches forth. Verse, about the first four or five verses of this uh, particular chapter have to do with the restoring the Word of God, whereby it would keep. That means the book, restoring the book. And the remainder is restoring...